start with a joke, because it's important to have to see a joke. My, my, my whole life was a joke, we'll tell a joke anyways, another joke. Um, <clears throat> there was once an IQ test being done for a Moroccan immigrant who came to Israel. Okay, and they asked, they showed uh, the Moroccan, here's the table with three legs. What's missing from the table? So he said, what's the question? You're missing Salatin, you're missing Borekas, <laughs> <laughs> you're missing the Arak. What is this? What's the question? Uh, the fast of Esther really is something special. What is it called? It's the fast of Esther, which means what? If you want to activate the light of Esther on Borim, this fast is very needed for that. When you look at it, that attitude, as opposed to, oh, another fast, I can't handle it, I need to find the leniency to get out of it. Instead of that attitude, use the fast of Esther to enhance the poor experience. She said, Esther, v'tsumu alai, she told Mordechai to tell the Jews, fast for me. She didn't say fast, you know, to, to, to activate the merit in heaven and then let that be for me. She said, fast for me, as if to say it's for her. You're fasting for who? You're fasting for Esther, to activate Esther. And who's Esther? We spoke these past weeks already what Esther is. Esther is the divine presence, it's the power of speech, it's the idea of Sarah. It's so many holy things that are activated by this fast. And so because of that, it's, it's chaval to, to find ways of leniencies. A fast means a fast, which is what? No drinking, no eating. And if a person is sick, so they have, they have exceptions. If a person is bedridden, and they're weak and they're to the point where they, they're going to faint and everything. So they're exempt. But a person doesn't have that and is just looking for an excuse to get out because it's difficult and it's uncomfortable. It's chava, you're losing out. First of all, the halacha is a requirement of the fast. But number two, the key to the Purim experience is specifically to the idea of fasting. We spoke about all these weeks, the idea of fasting, which is the concept of fasting, which is always to go back to the beginning and to reconnect. Because we said, just in short, when a person fasts, so there's no new energy coming in to feed the body. So the body has to go backwards to use energy stored in the body from previous days and weeks and whatever in order to function now. And that's the idea of activating of the idea of Yitchachut, renewal. To always go, go back to the beginning, fasting in the, in the eating sense activates that. So we said there's many ideas connected to fasting. So it's not just fasting, and also fasting itself is sometimes not suggested, optional fast. But here, where it's a national fast, it's called Tanit Esther, so it's a good option, an opportunity to grab it like a cake. And the Rabbi Nachman once said that when it comes to a fast, you should grab it like a good cake, because it, it's such a benefit of cleansing. What the fasting does, it stops and then lets you start again. You're not eating for one day, and then you're restarting again, brand new. So it's great. It's a great thing to, when a person is trapped in eating habits, whatever, which are just mainly, and most people have that. And that, that's a main cause for, for negativity, depression, for bad thoughts. He says in this lesson that we're working on, Lesson 62, that the desire for eating and drinking is the key for all the other desires in life. It's the key, it's the opening, it's the door that opens to let room for other bad instincts and characteristics to come out. So it's an opportunity to, to stop that and to restart, to re repilot, to reboot and to start again. So it's a good, it's a good, a good opportunity. And a fast is meaning there's no water, no food, nothing. That's, a, that's the definition of a fast. If you drink water, then it's no longer a fast. <laughs> a fast means that there's nothing coming in, and the body has to go back to, to, in order to, to function now. That's the idea of the fast. And fast of Esther, in Allah, it's the most lenient fast. It has the most leniency, that if a person has even a tiny eye pain, whatever, he's already allowed to eat. But it's a fast, and if you do it, there's a lot of benefit into it, visit So that's the answer, the idea of the fast. So, this week is uh, exciting. We're getting ready for Purim, B'zat Hashem. We're getting ready to, number one, blot out the Machshemo, Haman Amalek. And we're getting ready to receive the light of Mordechai, Esther, B'zat Hashem. And, mm -hmm. and hopefully through this, to have major, major miracles in life on a personal level, on a national level. And above everything else, to be filled with Simcha and to try to drag it on to the whole year, B'zat Hashem, the Simcha of Purim, B'zat Hashem. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, some more insights in the Megillah story of what really do we take with us, what can we take with us from the, from the Purim Chag, from the Megillah, what do we take with us? So if you look at the Megillah, it says at the end, towards the end, Layudin, Haita, Ora, Vesimcha, Vesasson, Vikar, by now everybody knows these words because it's a song, everyone knows the song, I assume everybody knows the, the, this verse. 
to translate. The Jews had, as if to say, from the Purim story, what we get out of it, we have the following four items. Ora, which is light. Simcha, which is joy. Sasson, an elated joy. It's a different level of joy. Vikar. Yikar is glory. So now the Gemara explains what are these four. Ora, the Gemara says, is Torah. The Jews received the Torah from Purim. Like the Midrash says, that until the story of Purim, the Jews were fulfilling the Torah because they were forced to. When were they forced to? At Har Sinai. They received the Torah at Har Sinai. So the, the Midrash says, the Gemara says that Hashem took the whole Mount Sinai, uprooted it, and put it above the whole Jewish nation, and He said to them, accept the Torah now. And if not, here will be your grave. You'll be buried right now under the mountain. So they were forced, the Gemara says, the Midrash says, to accept the Torah out of force. What happened in Purim? With the Purim miracle, the Jews, it says, Kimu kiblu. They established and accepted. So the Gemara says, what is it talking about here? They established what they had, had accepted already in Har Sinai, receiving the Torah, but out of force, now they accepted it, Kimu. They established it now out of love. But now we want willingly, open heartedly, to receive the Torah out of love now, not just out of fear of punishment that I have to because Hashem, He forced us to, to receive the Torah, but here, it's now the Jewish nation received it out of love. Kibu kibu. So going back, Laidi Maita Ora, Ora is light, and that refers to Torah, because what is Torah? Torah comes from the wording of Hora'a, instruction. When you have instruction what to do in life, you have light, you see where you're going. I know what to do, I'm not walking blind in life, I know what to do in life. I have guidelines, I'm taught this is the center, this is what to do, A, B, C, it's great, I feel confident, I feel good, I see clearly in life, that's the idea of Torah. Simcha, the Gemara says, is Yom Tov. The festivals, Yom Tov, a good day, which refers to the festival, festivals, because normally, <coughs> on Yom Tov, it's a, it's a time of festivity, it's a time of feeling good, it's a good day, because the attitude is good. The families are together, you're eating, there's no work, there's rest, the davening, there's this beautiful songs, whatever, then all the mitzvot of the Chag, they induce joy, the seder, who's not happy at the seder? Normally people are happy at the seder on the night of Pesach, and entering the sukkah on the night of Yom Tov, the first night of Yom Tov, people enjoy it, on Shavuot, the meals, whatever. The Yom Tov is associated with, with goodness, Yom Tov. And then goes on, Sason is Mila, circumcision, Brit Mila. Not to say that they didn't have until then, circumcision, or, or to go back, even Yom Tov, they, did, they had Pesach, they had Shavuot, they had Sukkot, but there was a new re-energizing, a new, uh, in, uh, what's instilling these items with a new meaning, a new dimension, which we're going to talk, we're going to explain tonight, B'zat Hashem. So, Sasson, this elated joy, refers to Mila, the Brit Mila, circumcision, and then Vikar, Yekar, glory, refers to the Gemara, says, Tfilin, Tfilin, so these four items. Torah, Yom Tov, Mila, circumcision, and Tfilin. What's going on here? What, what, are the, what are these things? And why, why these four things sticking out than all the other mitzvot of the Torah? That the Megillah makes an issue that for the Yedim Haita, the Jews had, as if to say they didn't have beforehand. And if you say there was again a renewing of these four, why specifically these four? What's going on here? So to reconnect to what we spoke about, if you remember last week, I'll re mention it now. We mentioned there's a chapter in the book of Psalms, chapter 107. We're talking, we're, from this psalm we learn the four types of people, four categories of people who have to give thanks to Hashem. Where in the time of the temple, the time there was Beit HaMikdash, these four would have to give a, bring a certain, a certain sacrifice called a Korban Toda, a thanksgiving offering, which included a, an animal as, a, as, a, as an offering plus four types of bread products, matzah, donuts, whatever, that exactly the details we won't go into tonight, but you had four types, ten of each, it was a lot of food, and it was a Thanksgiving offering, the Kohen had to eat part of it, and the one who brought the offering also had to eat part of it, and part was offered on the, on the actual altar, but there was, it's called a Thanksgiving offering, and the four mentioned in, in, in the Psalm 107, was the one who's traveling in the desert, number two, the one who's in, who was, who was in jail and came out, Number three is the one who was sick, deathly ill, bedridden for at least three days and, and came out of it. 
And number four, the person who traveled by sea and his skin came back alive. And the ships back then, when it was dangerous to travel by sea with all the storms, etc. So, over going over the sea, and today it includes even flying by plane, because it's still a danger. People don't, feel, don't realize it because it seems okay. But there's really a sakana when going over the sea because of the storms and the winds, etc., which are over the sea. So, these four have to give thanks. Today it involves saying Birkata Gomel, the special blessing that you say. If it's a woman, for example, after giving birth, where she's, she's, she's in bed for three days after giving birth, it's not easy. She also has to say Birkata Gomel. They get a minya and a quorum, and in front of them she says this blessing of the, thanking Hashem, the one who the one who gives to those who are liable. We don't deserve it. He does good, goodness for those who are liable, don't deserve it. Who did for me, the one who does good for those who are liable, who did for me good. That's the Birkat HaGomel. These four have to say this blessing. But it's, it's the idea of giving thanks. Thanks to Hashem, specifically these four types. Last week's class, we elaborated and extended that even though halachically it applies to these four types of situations, but we explained that there's a context, there's a concept of a desert, that a person is walking in a desert in life. He has no idea where he's going in life. So that's the idea of, of a person, personally, every Jew being in a desert, we go through this every week situations where I don't know what to do. I really don't know what to do in life. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what to make, what, what's, what's going to be. That's walking in a desert. That also when you get out, you have to think of, give thanks to Hashem in your own words. You don't say a brikata gomel, you don't bring a sacrifice. But you thank, you thank Hashem for the kindnesses that you got out. You found the light to get out of the desert. And also a person who's trapped in jail. When you know what to do, but you're being constricted, you can't do it. You feel that you have obstacles preventing you from doing what you know what to do. Now, after coming out of the desert, you know what to do, but you can't do it. You're stuck. It's like someone in jail. And when you finally, the, the constrictions and the obstacles are removed, and you're able now to function and do, ah, I can breathe. That's coming out of jail. And then the third category of someone who's mama sick, who has eaten inside such doubts and confusions, who is, God forbid, a person falls in a level of like a type of depression, a lethargy where they can't do anything. They're just sick in bed, spiritually, not just physical sickness, but they can't do anything. I don't know what to do. Like I, 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 my mom is so confused that as opposed to someone in the desert who's at least moving, he's walking. But the person now who's, in, who's sick in bed, the idea of someone who just is cracked and, and as, is being eaten away from the inside, and then coming out of that, thanksgiving also to thanks Hashem. And the last one, which is the hardest one, is the one who's in the sea. We said, Ya'alu Shamayim, Yadu Te'omot, the person who one day they, bring, they gave him such a spiritual high, he's flying, he discovered Judaism, discovered Hashem, discovered the Torah, discovered Eretz Yisrael, discovered, again, spirituality, and he's flying. And then the next day, crash, he's finished. And he can't handle it anymore. Hashem decide, or I'm in, or I'm out. But I can't handle this. And they, they, they tear a person apart by throwing him up, and convincing, you're here, you're here, but then the next day, boom, you're out of it. And that's the person who comes out of the, of, of the yam, the sea, who is able, after going through this also, to, give, to, to, to come out alive and to continue. That's literally a miracle, and that requires thanksgiving. So these are these four, and you'll see now that these four are connected to the four mentioned in the Megillah. To explain it says in the beginning that Ora, right? Ora, we said, is Torah. Torah is light. When you have instruction, we said, it gives you guidance. This is the beacon of light for the person who's trapped in a desert. A person who doesn't know what to do in life. He doesn't know what to do. He's so upside down, he's walking like in a desert. So what weapon does he have? What gift do we have from pouring that instills in a person this advice, this weapon, what to do? when faced in the year, in the life, with a situation of being in the desert, Torah. Torah study. Torah study, especially like we've mentioned, learning law, halacha, Torah law, we said has this power, this sigula, this charm, to help separate from within a person the good from the bad. The darkness, the confusions, the atheistic thoughts which are concealing Hashem's presence in my life, which is, which is due to the Yetzirah, that's the idea of the Yetzirah. And now, by learning Halacha, I can separate it so that the Yetzir Tov, the good inside of me, can have the, have the upper hand 
and to, to show me the presence of Hashem in my life and thus give me light and instruction what to do. That is due to Torah study. So whatever I go through in life, if I hold on to the Torah, especially Torah law, halacha, which is the essence of Torah. When they say Torah is from the wording hora'ah, instruction, so which area of the Torah does that refer to? In the Torah you have many parts. You have the Bible which tells a narrative, the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Exodus. And you have also the laws there, but it's by the way, it's not the essence of the, of the law. The main essence of the law is in the oral Torah, right? And you have the Agadatas, the stories in the Gemara, you have the Zohar, you have the Kabbalah. Which part of the Torah, of all these parts, is really instruction? That's halacha, Torah law, to know what to do. How to wake up in the morning, how to eat, how to daven, how to, be, how to, how to live as a Jew. Not just to say, oh, I believe in God, but I don't believe in, in, in practice. So, so what, what's your belief? If you don't believe in practice, how do you believe in Hashem? If you believe in Hashem, so you, you, you believe in Him, so you're willing to do what He requests of you. It doesn't demand so much, Hashem. It's not so difficult. It's step by step, is it Hashem? But halacha does that. That's instruction, or ra'ah. And this is, gives, gives a person light, because he sees clearly now what his purpose is in life. He sees Hashem in his life, and thus knows what has to be done. That's the gift of Torah to combat the situation of being in the desert. Number two, he said the person now who's in jail, chavush, right? Beit Asurim, someone who's in prison, he can't move around. He, want, he knows what to do now, but I'm, I'm stuck. They put me in a room. I can't do anything. What is this? I want to do this. I want to go to Dublin. I want to learn Torah. I want to serve Hashem. But I'm always obstacles. They're calling me at home. I have to do this. I have work errands. I have all things popping up. I have bills to pay. This guy calls me now. I just wanted to have a good night, just me <laughs> to study. And then all of a sudden, that person calls me. I need your help and this and that. Come fix my car and do this. All types of things pop up, preventing a person from doing what they know what to do already. And they're just stuck. There's obstacles. So this is the idea of being in jail. What to do when in jail? Be happy with what you have presently, what I can have, what I do have within my reach. I want, my aspiration is to do what's beyond right now. I have what to do and I know what to do, but I can't now. I'm being forced to stop. So what to do in the meantime with what I have available? Ah, I'm breathing. Thank you, Hashem. It's a good point. I, I can see, ah, it's a good point. The idea of finding the good points is the idea of Yom Tov. What is a Yom Tov? It's called a good day. But it's called the good day because the, the combination, the combination of all the good points in the year, they shine on the three festivals, on Yom Tov. That's why they're called Yom Tov. Every day has in it a good day. Every day has in it a good day. It also has a bad day. It depends on how you make the day. But the Yom Tovim are fully good days. They shine the light, the combination of all the good points of all the days. They come out in these three days. It's our job now every day to make today a good day Make today a Yom Tov. And that starts with finding the good of the day. Which means, with whatever situation I've been put in, to find the good in it. Okay, I can do this, at least I can do this. Okay, this not also, at least I can do this. I can find what's within my reach to be able to hold on and to do. And this is finding the good points. Finding the good points of little good things that I can do. It's not like all, most people have an attitude, it's all or nothing. Okay, Hashem, you don't let me do this, so I'm not going to do anything. Goodbye. You don't want me. I don't need you either. Chasa shalom. Goodbye. Let me sit in my corner. I don't, have, I, don't, I don't need this. I don't need anything. So that's a wrong attitude because you lose out. Hashem is trying to train a person. Find the good within you. I sent you something. You're not paying attention to it. You don't value it. So we're going to force you to value your good points. How? By putting you in a box, <laughs> cramped in a box. Now you have to find your good points. You can breathe, you can see, you can move your fingers. Ah, so this is called Yom Tov. This is the gift of Yom Tov to counter the person who's in a situation of being trapped in a jail. He's Chavush Beit Asurim. Now the third one, which we said is Sason, which is uh, this elated joy connected to circumcision. Mila, Brit Mila, circumcision. What's the idea of a circumcision? The idea of a circumcision is this is the main difference between a Jew and a non-Jew. Is that I have this covenant. Even if a non-Jew does circumcision, still we have a special covenant. We do it out of obligation. We have to do it. As opposed to someone else, it's optional. We as Jewish people, we have a bond between us and Hashem. And it's illustrated in this act of circumcision. A woman doesn't require circumcision. She's, her birth from a Jewish mother 
gives her the full values of the man having to do that stage of the circumcision. It applies to both. There's the idea of the Brit Milah physically for the man. And for the woman also, being a Jew is the idea of circumcision. That I have a Jewish identity, which is illustrated by externally by the circumcision. But it's the idea of being a Jew. Rabbi Nachman teaches that when a person is knocked out totally, totally, until he can't find a good point, because we said a person now is in jail, who can, has, move, room to move, has room to move around a little, he can value and live off and connect to the good points which are accessible. But how about someone who's totally in total darkness, totally knocked out, and he's little, like someone in bed, sick in bed, that he can't move? What about then? What can he use to revive himself at that point? The concept of, he says, Rabbi Nachman, Shalom Asani Goy. I'm not a heathen. I'm a Jew. This is not my doing. Right now, I can't do. In jail, I can do. I can have value of good things that I still have within me. I can try to do some good things and, and, and use what I have constructive, constructive in what I have available. But when I'm knocked out and I can't do anything and have a good point connected to that, there is one thing which is not my doing which is Hashem's doing, which is the good, which is etched in me. And what? Shalom Asani Goin. The blessing we say every morning, Shalom Asani Goin. I am not a heathen. I am a Jew. So what? This is the key for everything else. That I am a Jew, that means no matter what I go through in life, through thick and thin, I have a, a pact with Hashem that He will never abandon me. That's the idea of a bond of being a Jew. That our, our, our connection with Hashem is no matter where we go through, no matter what darkness we're thrown into, a Jew is always like a yo-yo. Wherever they throw him in life, any situation, but he's still connected with a string on top. And that's the idea of being a Jew, that I have this connection no matter what, that I can always turn to Hashem in the deepest down, in the darkest dungeon, under 20,000 feet underground. I can be stuck there, but Hashem is there with me also. This is the divine presence of Hashem, the Shekhinah, which escorts and un accompanies every Jew wherever they go, no matter what they may do. The worst sins, the worst things, like atrocities against mankind, against the Torah, against whatever. And yet, they still have this, what's called this pintaliyid, this point of their Yiddishkeit within them, their Judaism. And what, that, what does that allow them? That they have this connection with God no matter where they may go to. And at a, at a point when a person now is knocked out, like someone who's sick, is he serene, God forbid, where he's literally bedridden, but in a spiritual sense, that they're just totally out of it, they don't know that their mom is knocked out, and I can't do anything, what point can I use? The idea of the Brit Mila, which is the idea that I'm a Jew. Brit <coughs> also connected to the Brit Mila, the word Mila means on one hand, the circumcision, and it's called that because of the word Mal, which means to cut off. Le Malel means to cut off. But it happens to be that the word Mila is also connected to speech. Mila, a Mila is a word. Right? Meaning that even if a person is knocked out and can't do anything, a person who is accustomed to learn Torah, to do mitzvot, to move around, to do acts of kindness, to go to shul, to, to do things positive in their life, which are connected to serving Hashem, and now they can't do anything, there's one thing that stays with them, that's their mouth. There was a, a chassid, the previous generation, of Leo Chaim Rosen. He, for his life, he passed away at age 80 something, 88, 84, and uh, or even 90 and his last four years of his life he had typhus he had typhus when he was a young boy and it came back to the end of his life and he was stuck in bed for like four years he couldn't move he couldn't do anything and he anyone who came in to see him he was extremely happy and he told everyone who came into his room like this he said if i did not have the beautiful advice of talking to hashem now before they do it what would, able, what would I be able to do right now? To talk to, I, I can't learn. You take someone who's like learning in a yeshiva all day long, <clears throat> Torah study. You take that away from him, his life has ended. He has nothing in life, because his whole life is just learning, and learning and learning. Now he can't learn. He, he would tell you it's better to be dead, chas shalom, because it's so bitter for him, because he got accustomed to learning. But here, speech with Hashem is something that goes, your mouth goes with wherever you go also. And he said, I'm in bed, I can't move, I can't do anything, at least I can talk to Hashem. But even if a person can't do anything, he has the Mila. It's another idea. It's connected to Yom Tov in a way, but it's, in a, it's more limited. In that All I can do is talk. Ah, I have my mouth with me, I have speech. Some people don't even have that, God forbid, they can't even talk. So at least they have to be happy in the point that they're a Jew. 
But here, someone now who, who, who can at least move their lips, move their mouth, that's the idea of Mila, that a person who's knocked out, that the person who's in bed, and he can't move, so he has the Mila, the, the power of speech that, come, that is with him wherever he goes also. Wherever you go, your mouth goes with you. You take your mouth with you, and you can call out to Hashem wherever you are. That's the idea of the Mila, as it's connected to the circumcision. That, that expresses the bond. The bond of Hashem, right, with, that the circumcision does, that being a Jew does, is that I can turn to Hashem through speech, and always connect to him no matter where I am. So that, that's like, again, illustrates the connection of the Mila speech and the Brit Mila, the circumcision, which is the idea of being a Jew. And then finally, we have Yekar, which is, the Gemara says, the glory, which corresponds to Tefillin. What's the idea of Tefillin? And this is the hardest one for most people. This one is the most difficult one, but probably one of the most important ones. It's for the situations where literally a person is in a major crisis, and they have no control, they lost control totally of the situation. And it's like a person who's sick, at least he's aware of what's happening, even though it's painful. A person who's in jail, he's aware. A person who's in the desert, is aware. But the person who's Yalusha Maim, you do to Elmot, the person who's in the sea storm, where the, like, the ship is shooting him up, up to the skies, and then brings the ship down, the panic and the fear overcoming a person makes them lose all their senses. There's no brain here anymore. There's no me in control of the situation or connecting and being sane in the situation. It's when a person is in a crisis, a total crisis, and you can't expect of them to do anything in the situation. It's being thrown up by an external force and being thrown down. It's the ups and downs in my life which are being controlled by something outside of me. Like we said, the person now is a spiritual high. It's not him, it's he's being pushed up. And then they take it away, they take away the, the hand that's pushing him up now, let's go for a second, he falls and crashes. It's an external force doing this that the person is so mevubal, so confused that there's no, and the, there's no up to the person what to do to manage this situation. What can a person do in such a situation? The idea of tefillin. It's not just the physical tefillin, but the concept of the tefillin. What is the idea of the tefillin? The tefillin, when we put on tefillin, let's, let's look at the mitzvah of tefillin. We're taking parchments, we're taking items which have written in them what's called mochim, da'at, wisdom, mentalities, and we're attaching it to ourselves. Me, physical me, I'm taking an item which appears to be holier, very holy, it's called the tefillin, and I'm attaching it to my brain and to my heart in order to connect my heart and my brain to these ideas mentioned in the tefillin. And because it's an external force, it's a something external, it shows that there's something external to that. What does it correspond to? Rabbi Nachman has a beautiful story called The Seven Beggars. It's one of the longest stories of his 13 tales in the book called Rabbi Nachman's Stories. And there he talks about seven beggars who correspond to the seven shepherds. The seven shepherds, Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aharon, Yosef, David, they're called beggars because all the tzaddikim, even though they have merits, they have merits, they have, they can demand from Hashem based on their merits, yet the tzaddikim, their greatness is, they push everything on the side and present themselves to Hashem like a beggar, like as if they have nothing. Even though they have big merits and everything, they treat themselves like dirt, like Moshe Rabbeinu said, like Avram said, Anochi afar va'efer, what am I? I'm just dust, I'm earth. The tzaddikim, they're great, they have, they have shoulders, they have, they have what they have. And yet, when it comes to turning to Hashem and, and requesting for Hashem, like also Moshe Rabbeinu Chanan, I begged, I beseeched Hashem to let me come into the Holy Land. The tzaddikim, they have merits, yet they put everything on the side. These are the seven shepherds. And the, all the seven shepherds have a root. It's like if you look at the menorah. On the menorah, you have seven branches. And you have, of, of the seven, you have the middle one. So the middle stem holding up the whole menorah is also on one hand one of the seven, but it's also a stem. So if you look at the whole picture of the menorah, you have seven plus the stand, the basis, which is another one, so it's eight. The idea of the seven shepherds, the, the menorah corresponds to the seven shepherds. You have Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, the three on one side, Moshe Rabbeinu in the middle, and then you have Aharon, Yosef, David, the other three. Because in total in the menorah, there were seven branches, right? And the middle one, it says, El mul pnei 
Yairu Shivat Anerot, that all the seven, in other words, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and Aharon, Yosef, David, they face who? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, even though he came after Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, but he reached the highest level of being the tzaddik. Moshe Rabbeinu, it's called Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher. Uh, we don't call Avraham Rabbeinu, Yitzchak Rabbeinu, no. Our forefather, father, father, but Rabbeinu and Halacha, you have to honor your Rav more than your parents. If your Rav tells you to do one thing, and your, 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 so your father tells you to do one thing, and your Rav tells you to do another thing, according to Halacha, you have to, live, you have to listen to your Rav. It bypasses your parent. Why? As the Gemara says, your parent, they brought you into this world physically. It nurtured you, gave you food. And your Rav is bringing you to the world to come through his teachings mm -hmm. of how to come close to Hashem and not to waste your life, to make use of your life properly. They bring you to the world to come, to the true life. Your parents have a part. We give them shkoyach. We're not saying that what you did is nothing. No, we, we honor the parents. But when it comes between the parents and the Rav, the Rav is priority because he <laughs> is helping a person to bring them to their <coughs> ultimate purpose in life. So the honor is due more to a Rav. So even, the, even though Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov are our forefathers of Inu, they're tzaddikim in their own right, but they're also facing Moshe Rabbeinu. They also have to connect to and receive, in a sense, from the idea of Moshe Rabbeinu. So these are the seven tzaddikim, and the base, which is under the stem, which is Moshe Rabbeinu's candle, the middle one, you have the base of where he receives his koach from, his strength, which is a high level, a high level that only Moshe Rabbeinu can connect to. In total, these are eight, the number eight. In the tefillin, you have the number eight also. You have the four sections in the tefillin on the head. You have the four boxes, the four parchments, the four sections, plus the four which are written in a different format. On one parchment, we write all four and put it in the box in the yad and the arm, the arm part. But here, they're, they're written on four separate parchments and put in four different compartments. But in total, you have eight. This number eight is an allusion to the idea of the seven shepherds, including the source behind the seven shepherds, behind where Moshe Rabbeinu was receiving his strength from. It's called in the Kabbalah, it's called Keter. So these are the seven plus one eight and the tefillin. To go back, what does this mean now? That a person, every Jew, it's true, he has a personal connection with Hashem. You have your personal connection. When you dive in, Hashem listens to you. When you do mitzvot, it's to Hashem. Whatever you're doing for the sake of God, it's Hashem. But Hashem also put in this world people who are called tzaddikim, righteous individuals who already passed the test. They prove to themselves, and I guess to the world, that they have mastered in serving Hashem properly. They earned the title of becoming a tzaddik. What does that do for me, little me, that I can have their assistance and aid throughout my life to help me in difficult situations? When I feel all alone, I know there's a God, but I feel so far from Him. I need a push, I need chizuk, I need encouragement, I need someone to give me that boost to remind me that Hashem is listening to me. These are the tzaddikim. The job of the tzaddikim is to wake up Am Yisrael, to wake up the Jewish people and to be there for them when they are not, when a Jew can't be there. Like for example, in this situation, that a person is in a crisis, Ya'alu Shamayim, Yadu Ta'umot, he's in a sea storm, his brain is not there, I'm finished, I don't ask me anything right now, I'm so mumbled and jumbled, forget it, there's nothing here. Ya'alu Shamayim, Yadu Ta'umot. So this, what do I need to survive that situation? I need the idea of Tfilin. The idea of Tfilin is we attach upon ourselves the tefillin, which is this idea of attaching oneself to tzaddikim. The same idea exactly. What does it mean to attach oneself with tzaddikim? It means that I have a connection with them. I'm not again just a, 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 a person of the book and that's it. I have my Torah books and I have my shul, I have my God and that's it. Rather I also have an, a, an active connection looking for tzaddikim in my life to give me light in my Judaism. It's one thing I learn books, I read books, I read books, I read Gemara, I read Halakha, I read Chafetz Chaim, I read all these books. But it gets dry sometimes. It gets dry and I need that boost that re energize. And this is the idea of looking for tzaddikim to infuse a person with this boost of your Shemayim. He says in one place, Rabbi Nachman, looking at tzaddikim, 
give a person this boost, but especially hearing the Torah of the tzaddikim, believing in them, believing in them and their teachings, that they're not, they're not God forbid, a, a, a free loafer, they're not a, what's called a tzavua, they're not fake. These are real people who really want to help me to come close to Hashem. So by looking for these tzaddikim and having some connection with them, whatever it is, in the many formats that this exists, this the idea of putting on tefillin. The idea of putting on tefillin is not just now for men, it's like a physical thing of putting on tefillin. The idea of the tefillin really is to have this, uh, this awareness that I am always getting this boost. When a Jewish man puts on tefillin every morning against the heart and the mind, it's to wake up this reminder that, that my Judaism shouldn't be dry and empty, but should be full of enthusiasm. And I'm gonna need that for the times when I'm not there, so what I do every day serves as a picadon, a collateral for the situations when I can't do anything to protect me. So too the idea of tzaddikim. The more that I have a connection looking for tzaddikim to inspire me, so their merit, their holiness comes to my aid when I'm not there, when I'm mamash out of it, it gives me that light to help us. The Arizal teaches something unbelievable. The Arizal says that a Jew who sins even once, that sin is an opening for the evil to take a person. The verse says, by Cain, when Hashem told Cain, like before, like when, when he was depressed, when Hashem took the offering of Hevel and not Cain, right? So Hashem said, why are you sad? You gotta you got you got be careful. La petach chatat rovetz. La petach, at the entrance, at the opening, the sin is crouching. In other words, as soon as you make an opening for the sin, the Yetzirah has, uses that opening, he crouches, waits for that opening to grab a person. So our result teaches something unbelievable. Due to the severity of any sin, as soon as a person does anything wrong even once, he's technically considered trapped already by the Yetzirah. He's in the, he's in the other ballgame already, he's in the other domain. How does he get out? This is what Arizal says this. He needs nobody less than the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu himself. This is what Arizal teaches this. The soul of the Moshe Rabbeinu himself enters into this person to help him get out. In other words, on his own, forget it. He won't be able to get out. The rule is in the Gemara, Ein chavush matir tatzmo. Someone who's in prison, he can't get out himself. It's not like the escape from Alcatraz. <laughs> you can't get out yourself. Someone who's trapped, he needs an outside force to pull him out. Outside force is someone else who can help me. And the result illustrates this, the idea that Moshe Rabbeinu himself comes to the aid of a person. He, and it says what's called, it's a concept in the Kabbalah called the Ibu HaNefesh. That a person has an extension to his own personal neshama. The tzaddikim, for a temporary time, enter a person to give him this energy which is not him. It's not him. It's above his level and gives him like the incredible hulk. He breaks through and is able to get out of the situation. And once he's out, the tzaddikim, they leave that person. You see this a lot in many balay tshuva. In the beginning, they have a big light and they're doing amazing things. They're getting up early and they're doving like great and everything. And then afterwards, it's taken away and they feel total darkness. This is an example of the light of the tzaddikim helping people to do tshuva. That in the beginning, I had this boost. It wasn't you. It's true. It wasn't you. It's a, that's the real truth. And you think, oh, I can't believe it, I felt so good at the beginning. Where are those good golden times and everything? That was a gift to give you a taste of what's out there. And to help you get out of your rut, you needed this light above your level to get out. Once you're out, now you have to get to work. You take away the light, now get to work, and visit Hashem. You will get there and plus more if you hold on and you're consistent and don't give up, visit Hashem. But to go back, that we see the idea of the tzaddikim entering a person, helping him to get out. This is the idea of attachment to tzaddikim and where their assistance, their aid comes to us when I can't, when I'm stuck, when I'm mamash in a, a storm, a sea storm, and I'm, you can't expect anything from me. The idea of the tefillin, the concept of the tefillin, which by extension, the idea of the tzaddikim, so again, it's not just a masculine idea, it's also a feminine idea of attachment to the tzaddikim. Their merit comes in to a person to help them at that time when they're not there, to give them that boost to get a visitation. So these are the four gifts that come out of Purim. And which means that Purim is a new beginning now to utilize these four items in my, the rest of my year and the rest of my life. To utilize the idea of Torah study, the idea of finding the good points, 
the idea of remembering that I'm a Jew and I have a special bond with Hashem no matter what, and that's expressed in speech, the Mila, and also the idea of the tzaddikim, to look for the tzaddikim, that their assistance can help me at the times when I really need their help to get out to visit Hashem. This is what comes out of the poem story. That's one thing I wanted to mention tonight. Another point, something funny on the side, if you want to you can look at it in a funny way, about the meal that Achashverosh made for the Jewish people. The Megillah says like this, that when Achashverosh finally became established in his kingdom in the third year, he made a feast of 180 days for all of the ministers of all the 127 countries that he was the king over. And the, 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 the Megillah says that after the 180 days, he made an extra seven days for the people of Shushan. And the wording in the, the Megillah is, is the Am, Am, Ha'am, the nation. So the Midrash learns out that this is not referring to just all the people of the city of Shushan, but specifically for the Jewish people of the city of Shushan. And we said in the past that Mordechai warned the Jews, don't go, it's a, it's a ploy, it's a plot to trap you. And we said 18,544 Jews, that's the number exactly, did not listen to Mordechai and they went. Shushan was the biggest Jewish capital at the time of, this, of the story of Purim. The biggest population of Torah scholars and Jews was in Shushan. So it was a big chutzpah, it was a big, you know, a big uh, breach in the wall that so many Jews from such a high caliber Jewish community went and fell in and ate and partook of the Seudan afterwards, fell afterwards. So it says, if you look in the Megillah, it says in the describing the presentation of this of this of this seuda, even the first one of the 180 days, it says it says in the decoration that Achashverosh used to decorate his palace, it says there like there's there were pillars of shayish of marble, floors of all types of special stones, and and beds uh, uh, with golden covering and silver, and also reams of silver. So it says also chur karpas, beautiful colored materials of of drapes to close in, because it was a chatzah, it was an open courtyard, to make people feel comfortable. So Hashirosh closed it up with beautiful things that to make it attractive to the eye. So it says there, chur, chur kapas, of the items in the colors used for the drapes. So it says chur kapas. Chur kapas are two types of colors used in the decoration of the, of the vilonot, of the drapes that he put up. So if you look at the Megillah, and the actual Megillah itself, the actual parchment, the Chet is big, the letter Chet is big. And there's a commentary on the Megillah, Manot Halevi. He brings down that this Chet is an allusion to the number 8. That's what it stands for, 8. And it hints to what Achashverosh did at this festive meal. He donned the 8 garments, garments of the Kohen Gadol, the High Priest. He put on this low life, Achashverosh, he put on the garments of one of the holiest people in the Jewish nation, the Kohen Gadol. The few reasons was for that, number one, to break the morale of the Jews, but also to show that this was him, that he was now filling in the place of the Kohen Gadol, that he had that attitude to break the morale, but also to connect to the divine powers, whatever you want to call it, that are hidden in these eight garments. And he did a festive meal, right? So now, uh, the, the Kohen Gadol, his clothing, is, is a representation of who he was. It, it, the, all, every part of the, the garments, for example, you had the, the breastplate, the Choshe Mishpah with the 12 stones, indicating the 12 tribes. The whole Jewish nation was etched on, on his heart. Plus on the shoulders, the idea of the shoulders also, two attitudes of, of again, you have six, you had six uh, of the 12 tribes written here, inscribed here, on the, on the stone that was over here, and other six over here. And you had also on the breastplate, every part of the Kohen Gadol's garment was indication, indicative of who he was. He was the representative, representation of all of Israel by wearing these eight holy garments. And Achashverosh putting them on, he wanted to show that he was going to subdue the Jewish people by wearing the garments of the Kohen Gadol. However, there was a big difference between Achashverosh and the actual person who wore the, the, the eight garments, the Kohen Gadol. The first Kohen Gadol was Aaron. He was the one fit more than anybody else to wear the eight garments of the Kohen Gadol. Why? What was the greatness of Aaron HaKohen? That even though he was older than Moshe Rabbeinu, 
who was the older brother by three years older than Moshe Rabbeinu, who was already a prophet before Moshe Rabbeinu, yet Aharon had the ability to bend himself under Moshe Rabbeinu. Something unique. Greatness, and at the same time put himself under Moshe Rabbeinu. You're older than him. You're a prophet before him. Yet he knew the truth that Moshe Rabbeinu is Moshe Rabbeinu. In the menorah, he's the middle. Not me, not Aaron. And Aaron was able to bend. So he was worthy of putting on the eight garments. Meaning that there are tzaddikim at the level of Aaron, but they recognize they're not the real address. The real address is Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm not the real address. I'm, I have a specific, a specific mission. I may represent the whole Jewish nation, having them on the breastplate and everything. And yet, I'm humble and bent to my younger brother, Moshe Rabbeinu. This is the idea of Aaron bending himself to Moshe Rabbeinu. And he is the representative of the Kohen, the Kohen Gadol, what he, what he should be. That's why, unfortunately, there were many Kohenim Gadolim who bought the position in the Second Temple. The Second Temple, they all died. Uh, they, lived, they, they lived up to a year when Ken Yom Kippur, they, they died. There was only one who was special and lived for many years in the time of the Second Temple. And he earned the title of being called a tzaddik, Shimon a tzaddik. Shimon a tzaddik was also the Kohen Gadol, but also he's called a tzaddik. And what was his greatness? As he's mentioned in the Mishnah and Pirkei Avot, it says there what? Shimon a tzaddik haya mishiare knesset hagdola. Shimon a tzaddik, who was the Kohen Gadol in the time of the Second Temple, and he's called a tzaddik, he was from the what? The wording is the, the remnant, the left, the, the end, the, 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 in other words, the idea is the end of the period of the Holy Assembly, but it could be read also, Shiare, the leftovers. He treated himself as a part of the leftovers of the Holy Assembly, of the Knesset and Dola. He viewed himself as being a leftover. That's why he was able to be Shimon HaTzadik. He was a Kwan Gadol and also an outstanding Tzadik together in one because of his sense of humility. So this was something unique of Shimon HaTzadik being Kohen Gadol, also reflected in Aru. Now going back to Ahasuerus, what he was trying to do, this may sound a bit funny, but it looks very real. Ahasuerus is made up of two words. Ach, brother, and Achad, you have also Verosh. You have the Ach and Verosh. He's the brother of the real, the head. He's not the real head, but he's, He's, he's the brother of the head. He's not the head. He's not the leader. He, Ahasuerus, wanted to be the head, but he was really the Ahasuerus. And yet, he was putting on the garments of the Kohen Gadol. He was trying to show that I am the address. It's me. And he made a Suda for the Jews seven days. And this sounds a bit funny, but it's unfortunately, it could be real. This illustrates false Jewish leaders false rabbis who also put on <laughs> nice clothing, like the Kohen Gadol. They have a big strimal, big, nice, shining, glittering outfits, and they show that they're the address, that these are the tzaddikim, these are the real tzaddikim. But in reality, he's only the brother of the real Rosh. Rosh is a reference to Rosh B'nai Yisra, the leader of the Jewish people, which is, stands for Rabbi, who is the only Moshe Rabbi. Moshe is the Rabbi, the Rabbi, the teacher, the master. Achashverosh is the one who tries to imitate, he wants to mock, he wants to be. He's what's called a tzavua, a false person. He's trying to fool people. So you have false Jewish leadership. Achashverosh, you have people who wear a garment and they try to show the world that they're real tzaddikim. And they make a tish, what's called a Hasidic tish. He made a seven day ball, a seven day meal for the Jewish people. It's like these gatherings made by certain rabbis, certain leaders. And they give the illustration, come to me, I'll help you, I'm your address, but it's not the real truth. And, one, and this is the trick of Ahasuerus in this poem story. And in our lives, this is the trick of false Jewish leadership. People are there just for the honor and the glory. They wear the Kohen Gadol's clothing. They try to show that they're the big people, but in essence, they're not. It's not the real address. This was the trick of Ahasuerus. Who was really the Rosh of that generation? Mordechai. The people who went to the Suda of Ahasuerus did not listen to Mordechai, and they lost out because of that. So this is another message that comes out from the story of Ahasuerus and the Suda and Mordechai, is we have to look for true leadership. We have to find Mordechai. Purim has a gift in it 
that you that it becomes revealed to the person what's called the light of Mordechai, and that it helps a person to find these tzaddikim or the level of the tefillin that I can attach myself to. So we should be zochem b'zat Hashem that this poem should bring a lot of blessings. Use the weapons for the whole year of Bezat Hashem and we should find Mashiach Ka Bezat Hashem with the festival of Purim continuing even after the coming of Mashiach Bezat Hashem. Arachim Shabbaton, they, they mention this point. If you are familiar with the Arachim, even Esha Torah, they bring this down. If you look in the Megillah, in the listing of the ten sons of, of Haman who were hanged, you have three letters which have a different size. And when, when, a, when a sofer, a scribe, writes the Megillah, he has to make these three letters in a different size. One is smaller, or one is bigger, sorry, and two are smaller. In the, in the Aser <coughs> Nehemiah, you see there's the letter Tav, <coughs> big, and then you have Shin and Zayin, which are small. Tav, Shin, Zayin. If you take it as a number of a year, it corresponds to, at least in our millennia, in our thousandth, that we you know, the, the five thousandth of the Jewish calendar, it corresponds to the year 1947, after the Holocaust, right after World War II. The year 1947 was in Hebrew, Tafshin Zayin. What happened in the year Tafshin Zayin? There was the famous Nuremberg trials in Germany, done by the American government, right? And they hung 10 of the top SS officers who were mainly involved in the killing of the Jews in the Holocaust. 10 were hung, okay? Before, this is brought down even in, in newspapers, I saw the articles, I remember seeing the Arachim uh, pamphlet, they actually brought the articles from the New York Times, whatever, from 1947. Before they hung the last one, I don't know what his name was, the last of the ten, all of a sudden he shouted out, he shouted out in German, Purim Festival, fe the Purim, Purim Sameach, and the year, 1947, Tafshin Zayn, whatever. He said Purim Sameach, that year, and they hung him. The whole the, the world was shocked, obviously, and uh, those who looked into it, they saw this connection clearly. In the ten sons of Haman, you have those three letters which correspond to the year Tafshin Zayin, which is 1947. You have ten, and here you have also ten who were hung, and all of a sudden this guy said Pur Purim Sameach, 1947. Huh? Was it on Purim? I don't know. I don't know if it was on Purim, but he, he said, said Purim. He said Pur Purim Fest. Porn Fest, that's the word, right? It wasn't Porn Fest. Porn Fest, 1947? Or he didn't say the year. I don't know. I, I, I don't know about the year part, but he said Porn Fest and people couldn't figure it out. And this connection was made between the ten sons of Haman. And we know Hitler and Haman have the same characteristics. Haman was after the Jews. Haman said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to be smarter than Pharaoh and smarter than Esau. I'm going to kill all the Jews. Men, women, children. That was Haman. That's what Hitler did. Hitler wasn't concerned if the Jew was observant or not, if he wore tefillin, if he didn't wear tefillin, you were Jewish, that's it, I'm going to destroy him. That, that, that was Hitler and Haman. That was the, 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 the comparison. So the ten officers of Haman, of Hitler, it makes sense that, that there's a connection. So that was something known, that was something in the world, it was a big thing. It's been around for about 50 years, this uh, Chidush, this connection. It's, uh, it's mentioned all these Shabbatonim of, uh, of Arachim, these conventions. The, uh, the straps of uh, the film, yeah. uh, they have the Kedusha, right? The for sure, the for sure, for sure. So a lot of times I see men throwing, you know, they, they rolled, they rolled up. And it's on the floor. And they throw them on the floor. They, they had, potentially, potentially, potentially yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. throw them on the floor. Ideally you should put it on, 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 a, on, a, on, a, on a chair or on a table. What can you do sometimes when doing it, it falls by itself unintentionally, it's, un it's uncontrollable. Yeah. That's understood, but when people like this, they throw it like that.